I remember thinking that I had never felt so small. I stood on the deck of the largest ship that I had ever seen in my life, in the middle of an ocean that stretched out forever in every direction, with what seemed like the entire universe spread out above me. I couldn't stop snapping pictures, but not a single one has seemed to capture the sheer magnitude of what I saw. My last picture had a strange sort of blur in it that I couldn't immediately place, at least until the wind had shifted and a small cloud of something was blown into my face. It smelled uh, smoky. Seconds later, watching the direction that it came from, I saw more of it drifting downward toward the ocean. I leaned over the railing and craned my neck to see where it was coming from. A man stood on the deck above me, young looking and wearing a crew uniform. He had a large cardboard box propped against the railing and was scooping out handfuls of sandy gray matter to toss overboard. I hate to admit how long it took me to put this together, but once I did, I freaked out and started swatting at my hair and coat. I had just taken a face full of human ash. When I looked up again, the man was staring down at me. I gave him what I hoped was an apologetic look and he grabbed the box and ran. The next morning over breakfast, I was confiding in my cabin neighbor, Anne. I told her about the guy spreading ashes and how much it had freaked me out. She told me that she thought it was a nice way to go out. I guess at her age, she thinks about that sort of thing more than I do. Before we could finish discussing it, an announcement came over the ship's speakers. An overly chipper voice was telling us that a storm was forecasted for tonight, and for safety reasons, we would all be asked to stay in our cabins from 10 p.m. until breakfast. I immediately pulled up my phone and checked the satellite maps online, but nothing I saw suggested a rough seas or any kind of storm front. I spent the day relaxing, I mean it is a cruise after all, but the later that it got, the more I found myself watching the sky. Where was the storm supposed to be coming from? Even when time was creeping towards a new curfew, there wasn't a cloud in the sky, just millions of stars. It was breathtaking standing at the railing and seeing the Milky Way touch the horizon. My thoughts were interrupted by a crew member asking me to please move to my cabin for my own safety. It was after 10 now and the decks were occupied, only by the crew and the last a few stragglers who were ushering indoors. I apologized with a smile, which the crew member didn't return. I assumed he was one of the last friendly ones, but the longer that he stared at me, the weirder that it got. He didn't move or take his eyes off of me until I was completely out of sight. Even then, I think I saw him peek around the corner when my door was shutting. A few hours passed and curiosity had got the best of me. I snuck out of my room. Not that there was anyone watching anyway, and went out onto the deck to see what this dangerous storm was all about. It was nothing. Not a raindrop, not a snowflake, not a single rough wave. The sea was calmer than it had been in days. Even the wind had died down completely. I wandered down the deck towards a row of light boats, absently staring at the gentle waves rolling in the distance. A faint voice caught my attention. I could barely make out two dark figures in the distance, one leaning on the rail and another standing and holding a large box. I snuck closer, ducking down behind the lifeboats, trying to hear what they were saying. That's so gross, a feminine voice giggled. Grosser than touching it, a male voice responded. He pulled a large plastic spoon out of the box, the kind that you would usually use for ice, and poured a scoop full of something over the railing. After last night's discovery, I assumed it was more ash. Do you put it back in the kitchen? What if I do? The conversation devolved from there to teasing, with him randomly acting like he was going to throw a scoop of ashes at her, and her squealing and giggling and swatting him on the arm. I was about to move on when she picked up a second box and started to tip it over the railing. 
He jumped forward and snatched it out of her hands. Is this what you've been doing? He half shouted. I'm not touching that, she whined back. You can't just dump it all in. He wasn't teasing anymore, and her face fell to the dark look that he was giving her. Why does it matter? It just does. I know you're new, but the rules are important. He gave her such a look of contempt that even I shrink back. I shouldn't even be here, he mumbled half to himself. I was supposed to be on 12. Well, then maybe you should go, she snapped back. He threw his plastic scoop back into the box and stormed off, thankfully in the opposite direction from me. She watched him go, and as soon as he was out of sight, she dumped her entire box of ash over the edge and left too. She was trying to look tough, for who, I'm not sure. But when she had passed my hiding place, she was chewing her lip off and fidgeting with the chain around her neck. I waited a few minutes before coming out and going to the railing. I looked down into the ocean below. The clump of ash had already disappeared as somewhere below the surface. As I searched, another faint cloud had drifted past as somewhere below. I scanned the decks beneath me and finally spotted another hand reaching out, scattering ash to the sea. A cold chill crept down my spine. I looked back and forth along the decks. The more that I spotted, the easier they were to find, both above and below. More than I could count. Every deck, every section, as far as I could see in every direction, every last one of them tossing human ash to the depths below. Anne came to check on me around noon. I had been holed up in my cabin since last night and she got worried when I didn't show up for breakfast. I had to have looked crazy, checking both ways down the hall before I even let her in. I told her everything. I mean, I had to tell someone. This was way too much for just one person. She patted my hand and said that it had to be some kind of program. You and I are lucky. There are a lot of people that never get to see this part of the world. Some people never get to travel or sail at all. I know that she meant well, but she wasn't there last night. I needed her to understand how big this was. I made up my mind before she had even left. I was going back out there. I was taking my camera and I was getting evidence. A little after midnight, I crept up the stairs to a higher deck. I didn't want to take the risk of running into anyone who worked near my cabin and they might recognize me. A new curfew had become a standing order on the ship, although I saw no evidence of foul weather. The deck up there felt bigger, and it was high enough to give me a touch of vertigo when I looked over the railing. I kicked myself for not choosing more carefully. There were hardly any places to hide here. I was just thinking about moving to another deck when... I heard a door open behind me. I crouched in the darkest shadow that uh, I could find, armed with only my camera, praying that my breathing wasn't too loud. Another crew member with another cardboard box emerged and started making his way down the deck. He placed the box next to the railing and looked out at the ocean for a minute. I switched my camera on as quietly as possible. I had already turned off the screen so the light wouldn't get me away and I had a long zoom lens equipped so I wouldn't have to get too close. From here, I could see pretty much every detail. I zoomed in on his face first and breathed a sigh of relief. He had earbuds in. As long as he was listening to something, he wouldn't hear my camera shutter. I snapped one shot of his face just to make sure. Zero reaction. This might be easier than I thought. I backed off the zoom a little bit to get a clear shot of his jacket with the ship's logo. And then I noticed that he was wearing a piece of jewelry. A silver chain around his neck that I felt like I had seen before. I zoomed in again to see a shining pendant dangling over his chest. With some kind of symbol carved into it. I got a few shots but none of them came out very clear. The boy dipped out of frame and I had to zoom out. He had bent over and was reaching into the box at his feet. My finger touched the shutter, waiting for the scoop of ash to be visible. He pulled out a human arm. It was charred beyond reason but completely unmistakable. 
It had a hand, four fingers, and a thumb. And I think that it even had a ring on it. Bio crept up the back of my throat and he threw the arm overboard. Cold as it was on the deck, I began to sweat. I found enough focus to hold the shutter and to close my eyes. My camera clicked rapidly, catching shot after shot of something that I couldn't stand to watch. Eventually, my fear of being caught overcame my revulsion, and I managed to open my eyes up again. I watched the boy throw his last few chunks of a thankfully unrecognizable flash over the railing, and then he just stared down into the box. I held my breath, not sure if I could handle another twisted revelation. He pulled his sleeve over his hand in a barrier and reached in. What he pulled out, I see that scorched face every time I close my eyes. I was still dry heaving in the shadows when he walked away with his empty box, and I stumbled to the railing, hoping some fresh air would soothe me. Like an idiot, I ended up looking down at the ocean. I saw hundreds of them bobbing in the water, just pieces, everyone burned to a crisp. I followed the railing towards the back of the ship, too stunned to care about being seen. The sea below was littered with what was left of humans with more still falling from the ship. I stood at the furthest point of the deck, watching them float away in the wake of the ship. Maybe it was paranoia sinking in, but I swear that I could see a few disappearing. Someone shouted from an upper deck and I ran. I didn't stop until I was barricaded in my cabin trying not to cry. I was pretty sure that I had stayed far enough ahead to lose them, otherwise they would have been breaking down my door. There was no way I was supposed to see any of that. I didn't turn on any lights that night, and I sure as heck didn't sleep. I dragged my laptop into my closet, and I loaded my pictures on it. I decided not to post them until I was safe and off the ship. I regret that now. As soon as I heard noise in the next cabin, I ran over and begged Anne to let me in. She was shocked to see me up so early. The first thing I did was sit her down and make her look at the pictures that I had taken. She tried so hard to explain it all the way, but I think she realized how messed up it was. She thought that we should just stay quiet and go back to our normal cruise activities. Keep our noses out of business that wasn't ours. I wanted to argue, because whatever was happening was clearly shady and probably illegal. But after last night's close call... I didn't think that I should be taking the risk, so I let it go. I still wouldn't leave the cabin. Anne was nice enough to sneak food from the buffets to bring back into me and we passed the day with card games and TV shows. I even managed to fall asleep a little bit after dinner. I was wide awake and reviewing the pictures on my laptop for the tenth time when the knocking started. They had announced themselves as maintenance saying that there was a problem with the room. Anne woke up and I went to answer. I swear I tried everything to stop her, but looking back it probably wouldn't have helped. I hid in the closet. It was really the only place to hide in these cabins. I just knew that whoever was knocking it wasn't good, and I didn't want them to know that I was here. It was over before I could even think about intervening. Anne's voice had gone from confused to muffled in an instant. It sounded like she had tried to fight, but she was easily overpowered and dragged out of the room. She's not here. The voice through the wall had stunned me. Probably snuck out again. They were in my cabin. Well, if she's outside, she's fair game. Should we get a backup? Better ask the captain. I waited until the voices were gone and then I took off down the hallway. I wasn't even sure that I was going the right way, but I thought it was the direction that they had taken Anne. This ship felt like a maze tonight. I ran blindly down hallways, making wild guesses and finding more dead ads than I knew existed. I opened every stairwell that I found, listened for noise, and moved on. I prayed they were still on this deck, and if not, I might never find them. After what felt like the millionth wrong turn, I had to stop and catch my breath. A little clarity finally came over me, and I found the nearest door out to the deck. I looked both ways and thought that I saw movement near the back of the ship, so I ran. 
I came around a corner to see Anne, alone, gagged and bound to the railing by her wrist. With no crew in sight, I ran to her, pulled the gag off, and started untying her. She thanked me, her face wet with tears. I heard a door open behind me and worked faster at the ropes. There were at least two people judging by the yelling, and one of the voices sounded familiar. I untied Anne just in time and yelled for her to run and get inside. I wasn't sure why, but something that I had heard back in the cabin made me think that she'd be safer indoors. Two young men from the crew were rushing at me, and the first thing I did was put myself between them and Anne, hopefully giving her time to get away. I need the first one. It was the angry guy from two nights ago, solidly between the legs, dropping him to the deck. The other one tried to shove past me, but I grabbed him by the jacket and pulled him off his feet. I managed to stay on top of him for a minute, but he was struggling hard. I held on to whatever I could until something broke and I was shoved off and out of the deck. The first guy stumbled back to his feet. I thought that he was coming for me or maybe going after Rad but he ran back the way that he had come. I looked back towards the railing. Something was creeping up at the side of the ship, so pale that it was almost translucent. Four long digits felt their way up the railings and then a fifth, a fully formed hand. Each finger larger than my whole body, it slid up and over the railing, skimming along the deck. It hovered near the guy that I had just been fighting with. He reached for his neck, searching. He looked to me and I opened my hand to reveal the silver pendant. He dove towards me, screaming incoherently. The hand was faster. It descended on him like a cage, and then wrapped its fingers around him one at a time. Everywhere, the pale white skin touched him, his clothes were burned away and his skin was scorched black in an instant. Screams of pain echoed around me and I was choked by the scent of burning flesh. I clutched the pendant to my chest and prayed that it wouldn't notice me. He kept eye contact with me the entire time he was being lifted over the railing. I think he expected me to save him somehow. Driven by shock, I crawled to the edge and looked over. I could see the rest of the monster's arm glistening under the moonlight. Its skin stretched thin over bones and bulging at the joints. The elbow was crashing into the sea where I'm grateful that everything else was hidden in the pitch black waters below. I watched the man that I had inadvertently doomed being dragged into the water still screaming. For his sake, I hoped that it was quick. After the water had gone still, I heard a shout. Within seconds, I was surrounded and being dragged back inside. They took back my stolen pendant and locked me up in a little cell in the security office. They tried to interrogate me, but I answered their questions with my own. They wanted to know where my camera was. I wanted to know where Anne was. They wanted to know everything that I saw and wanted to know why we were doing this. And we went in circles for a good long while, but no one got any answers. Right now, I'm still locked up in security with a phone that I stole from one of the crewmen. It doesn't have cell service out here, so it's only the ship's Wi-Fi and I don't have any of my pictures for proof. This is the best that I can do. I still don't know why they were feeding that thing. I'm starting to wonder if it's real purpose of bringing a cruise this far south. I'm pretty sure I at least know why Anne and I were chosen. Both traveling alone, easy targets, and easy enough to make up an accident for me or natural causes for her. Not a ship this size. They've got plenty more to choose from. I don't know how many others they're going to sacrifice. They spent at least three days chumming the water, so I'm betting they warmed it up for a good feast. It's only a matter of how many they think they can get away with.